Ring, Ring Wilson, uh, who, well, most of you probably know us by the truth, uh, but he's, that's not the only part he's been through. He's also worked, uh, <clears throat> uh, he's also played a part on 60 Under, and most recently he's been on Jillian Flynn's Utopia, uh, where he plays Michael Stern, and he will also be narrating the Dutch series from now uh, Besides his screen career, He's has also published his self-biography, The Bassoon King, in 2015. Uh, and most importantly, probably for me at least, as a digital media student, he has also founded the Soul Pancake, a, a digital media company that focuses on bringing smart and uplifting content, uh, which has been named one of the past companies, top 10 most innovative video companies of 2015. And if you have English suggestions, check their Instagram. And while we're at it, maybe even follow us on Instagram as well if you haven't already. Uh, um, but now I've just said most of what I have to say. <clears throat> uh, I have a few questions for you, Ray. Uh, I'll start with getting this off the bat straight away because uh, I've been told that you're trying to avoid as much dead hand characters as possible recently. Uh, just to change a bit from Dwight. <laughs> I don't know if it's true, but that's what I've been told of. Um, who, who told you that? Who told you that? Uh, the internet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I read some article about it, actually. I can't remember what was the paper. Mm. Um, but um, if you had anything to say to your uh, 39-year-old self when you started playing at the office, what well, would be the one thing you'd say to them? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. And the internet is wrong. Surprise, surprise about something. Unbelievable. No, I um, I loved playing the role of Dwight. It was a seminal role for me, uh, broke open my career, opened so many doors for me. I uh, was so proud to be a part of that great office tradition, of course, started in England with the 12 episodes they did in, at the BBC and and then moved to the American show. And um, there's been office shows done in all the so many countries around the world, including Israel and um, Germany, many other places. Um, but yeah, well, that's a great question. What would I say <laughs> to myself at 39, just undertaking the role of Dwight? Um, you know, I guess I would have said, you know, fasten your seatbelts because the uh, the kind of fame and the amount of fame that hit us uh, right away from the success of that show was pretty intense, where I had been this unemployed actor for such a long period of time and uh, just, you know, barely making my rent and, and struggling uh, at that point for a good 14, 15 years before I was doing The Office. And um, then all of a sudden people were interested in me and being in movies and doing commercial campaigns. And um, it's a pretty um, difficult transition to make. It's kind of every person's dream to all of a sudden, like, we want you to star in our movie. We want you to have this big commercial campaign. We want you to play these other roles. And for, a, for an insecure, mostly unemployed, weird looking actor uh, in his late thirties at that time, uh, it was pretty, um, it was pretty darn exciting, but that can really go to your head. So uh, I think my advice would have been all around how to kind of ground myself in preparation uh, for uh, the, the the roller coaster ride that I was about to go on. Well, in your defense, you did amazing. So uh, I think you can have a pre prepared any better than what you've done. Um, but on that note, uh, how do you feel like after you finish? Playing Dwight, how do you feel like that carrying the the, the name uh, came? So every time someone obviously you went in public, they'll definitely recognize you. Uh, did you feel like that would be too much for a bit, uh, or were you happy that people were recognizing for the character? Well, um, yeah, it was strange. All of a sudden, uh, that's a very strange sensation to go through. Uh, emotionally, psychologically, where all of a sudden people do double takes at you and do the and surreptitiously watch you and then surreptitiously film you. Um, and 
uh, call out from their car windows like, hey, Dwight, yo, Dwight. Um, or in England, they'd be like, oi, Dwight. Um, uh, that was that was pretty uh, that was pretty intense. And uh, but like I said, sometimes it can be annoying. Sometimes I just want to be left alone. I if one good thing is coming from this whole COVID nonsense, it's the fact that I will now for the rest of my life be allowed to wear a medical mask around my face wherever I go, wherever I go. No one will think twice about it. They'll be like, oh, he's just some weird germaphobe or he's a little sick or something like that. And then I won't have to deal with the, uh, with the Dwight fans in that way. Uh, but I love Dwight fans. Most of them are so um, grateful for the show. And, th and that's the thing that um, is really important to note is that what I hear every day on social media and when I run into people, it's um, thank you for the show. It got, a, got me through some really hard times. You know, I was really depressed. I was really anxious. My family was having a struggle. My family member was sick and we watched the office and we laughed together or, um, and it's really special to have been a part of something like that. That's good. It's, it's good to hear, um, especially about the last part that it helped you get over some, some issues, the personal issues. Um, another thing I wanted to ask, uh, and I'll try to make this the last office related question, uh, and right. it's only half related, um, between Steve Carell and Ricky Gervais, uh, yeah. if you had to pick one to work with, no pressure. Wow, you're trying to get me in trouble, aren't you? <laughs> Maybe. Is it, is it, are you trying to get me in like, um, is this to be like on the cover of the mirror, the sun in England? It's like rain, How? rain, hoax, Ricky, rain, Ricky can take a hike. Steve's a, um, listen, I can't, you, you, no, that's like Sophie's choice. Like you're asking me to choose between my children. You're asking me to choose like, which would you rather you could only you have to keep your father alive or your or your mother alive? And Ricky is like my father, who birthed the concept of the office and is responsible for the brilliant comedy behind it. And Steve Krell's like my mother is the the nurturing, kind, sweet comedic presence that was with me day in day out for two hundred episodes of The Office. I can't choose between them. You can't make me choose between them. I don't Sorry. try to make you choose it. That was a perfect answer, actually. I'm really happy. It was very wholesome. Um, but now a little bit off the office, promised, like I promised. Um, I've seen that recently you've had, um, <clears throat> uh, you've been on Kid Correspondent uh, for your media company uh, talking about uh, political uh, debates. Um, and obviously, like I was talking to you earlier today, uh, I've come from Brazil, so things are pretty bad as uh, there as much as they are in the US right now. Uh, you did mention that it's good for everyone to listen, uh, which is pretty much a topic we've had on a debate a couple of weeks ago uh, that people we, we believe that people should be able to listen more over talking. Um, but you did mention that only for uh, healthy debates where people are willing to listen. How would you react on? a debate where the person's not giving you the opportunity to listen, let's say either through just not letting you speak or just playing dirty tactics, like something uh, suppressing the media or just fake news or something like that, not trying to imply um, anyone. But uh, how would you react on uh, when if you get caught in a situation where you don't have the chance to speak back? Um, well, um, that's an interesting question. I didn't think I'd be asked that. Um, <laughs> there's not a, there's not an easy answer to that there's you know that's it's a very complicated topic and it has a lot of different tendrils it has a lot of different facets um we no longer have healthy debate uh, in the united states i can't speak for brazil or for the uk but in the united states we we no longer have um that idea that two people can strongly disagree about policy and making policy decisions and talk about why they believe that their policy decisions are the right policy decisions 
and not get personal and not attack the person delivering the message. Um, and also listen and respect, if not the point of view, respect the fact that the person has a differing point of view and that we need to allow for differing point of views. So, you know, this, this has evaporated from uh, the American political discourse. The main reason is because of partisanship. And rather than get into like, what would I do? I don't know what I would do. I'm never going to run for office. So, you know, what would I do? I would, you know, I would pretty much probably stop things and, uh, and demand that they be run in a civil fashion. But partisanship is really uh, treacherous. So, um, for instance, you have in the United States, the Republican Party is, has recently taken a very anti-China stance, uh, both militarily and economically. Uh, the political left is not necessarily pro-China, but because the other side is kind of like anti-China, they're they won't even speak out against negative things that China is doing. So hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Muslim men in kind of re, re, detention centers, re, re, what do they call those retraining uh, centers, uh, education centers of the, the Uyghurs. And this is one of the most grotesque human rights violations on the planet going right now. But the political left in the United States won't speak up against it. Why? Because the political right is very anti-China. So we're not going to kind of, as a country, come to kind of a, uh, a policy decision that really takes all these aspects of China into account because partisanship is getting in the way of just common sense. In this case, human rights. So um, that's just one of uh, countless examples. Uh, yes, that, that was a very kind of like a curveball to, to my last questions. I'm sorry about the unexpectedness of the question, um, but it was great to hear that from you. Um, another thing I'd like to know, going back a little bit with Soap and Cake, um, is how, uh, when, how exactly you came to the idea of starting a media company? Um, and did you have any help? Did you just decide to do it on your own? Uh, and have you been having fun with it, most importantly? Thank you. Thanks for asking. And for, and for people who don't know, it was briefly in your introduction, Leo, but um, so Soul Pancake is a digital media company. It exists predominantly in the public interface as a, as a YouTube channel and Facebook channel, social media uh, shows. And when we started it 11 years ago, 12 years ago, we started speaking about it. The initial idea was I wanted to get young people talking more about life's big questions. It's like, I felt like there was a generation out there that had kind of pretty much bought the message that contemporary society was selling them. They got swindled. It's like, oh, my life is about comfort and about popularity, status, accruing things, owning things, um, not questioning capitalism, not questioning human rights, not questioning social justice issues, just kind of like going along with the kind of American Western civilization status quo. And I thought one way of addressing this was to get people talking about life's biggest questions, like literally like, why are we alive? You know, what happens after we die? You know, what is love? What is consciousness? Philosophical questions, um, spiritual questions. Um, this was one thing I felt like young people were because so many young people had rejected religion, then they had kind of thrown the baby out with the bathwater and were no longer having discussions about spiritual topics, about, you know, do we have a soul? And, um, you know, is the golden rule right? You know, um, there's not even, those discussions weren't even being had because if you vaguely brought up anything having to do vaguely with something that had a, a whiff of spirituality, and again, this is a partisanship issue, then that meant that it's anti-science de facto, and they were not having these conversations. So the, the origins of Soul Pancake was to get young people to have deep, meaningful, rich conversations. I did this with an amazing team of people, my co-founders, uh, Devin Gundry and Golriz Lucina and Shabna Mogarabi, 
Um, uh, I get the credit. They did all the work. They're amazing. Um, and uh, uh, Gol Reese is the only one who's currently still with the company. Uh, Shabnam was its very successful CEO that took it through many iterations. And then as a digital media company, we, we focus more and more on video content because we realized that we were better at doing video content than we were at having kind of an, an interactive social media site, which was its uh, first iteration. And um, it was fantastic. We um, kind of stumbled in this kind of niche of making inspiring videos, uplifting videos, videos that got people talking. So we, we were true to our original concept, but we went a different path to get there. We were making videos to spark conversation. Um, I'm very proud of the work that Soul Pancake has done. We have over a billion video views, um, some very successful shows. Uh, we've sparked some incredible conversations. We've brought people from both the political right and the political left to the table to be speaking about some really fundamental kind of human, uh, human issues rather than, than partisan issues. Uh, and, and going back to the partisanship, just just a little note on that, because we were talking about that before. Um, for the political left in the United States, for many of the political left, because they perceive oftentimes the political right as being quote unquote anti-science and kind of religious and anti-science, that for the political left, if anything comes up that's vaguely like religious or spiritual, it's then just like China, it's, it's equated with the political right and they don't want to touch it. So partisanship has become this kind of toxic kind of magnets that push against each other um, and just over and over again and uh, don't find any kind of um, resolution or um, uh, points of unity. That's all, thank you. Um, so a little bit more, um, oh, <clears throat> sorry, my throat's a little bit bad to say. Um, some water. I'd like some water <laughs> if only. <laughs> um, a little bit more on Soul Pancake. Um, I've seen that recently, like the latest Instagram post, it had just a massive um, mashup with pretty much a lot of people you've worked with and uh, either people you've acted with or just people invited to the show. Uh, all had some really interesting points to say and it was a very wholesome uh, kind of like um, staple video uh, for Soul Pancake. Um, having in mind like people you've worked with, how do you, um, who would you be looking forward into working in the future, uh, with in the future? Uh, from, from my Soul Pancake experience specifically? Um... I mean, there's there's so many amazing collaborations we've made over the years. Um, this guy, I wonder, this guy Brad Montague created the Kid President series. That was a very big series, and now Kid Correspondent, and he wrote this book, Becoming Better Grownups. Uh, he's a genius. Um, I use that. I rarely, if ever, use that word, but he is one of those. Um, you know, um, boy Justin Baldoni who was an original director in our, in our core team. And um, he uh, directed a show called My Last Days, which was about lessons we can learn from people at the end of, about life from people who are at the end of their life. Uh, he's gone on to start a very successful company, Wayfarer. He's a very successful director. Um, he's someone I would love to work with again. Um, we have very similar kind of point of view and values. Um, there's, you know, many uh, creative voices were uh, launched at Soul, uh, with Soul Pancake, and I'm very proud of that as well. That's really good. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, as a personal opinion, um, I'm not originally from uh, Cambridge University, so it's really good to see um, that one of our speakers is very related to, uh, to, to the creative side, even though it's not what you're mainly known for. Uh, when I when I saw that, I was just like, "This is really good. I'm really excited about it." Um, but yes, I'm I'm very glad you're here. Um, something else I'd like to ask. Um, I say, like I was talking earlier as well, you uh, starring in Utopia. Um, how has been the experience of having such 
uh, a different turn on the uh, on the usual things you do, uh, and plus also narrating for for the docu series we are the champ the, the champions. Uh, yes, well, so I'm a part of another uh, British show that has been turned into an American show. In this case, Utopia, and uh, in this case, uh, we met with the exact same criticism um, and vitriol from British from the British people. Um, that shows a very, I think what it I think it re re reveals about the UK is a a kind of a a kind of like that that old school British empire nationalism of, of Britain, because they did, you know, the Amer the British office, they did 12 episodes. And then a couple of years later, we started our show and we were just like, no, the UK office is the greatest office. There will never be a greater office. And when we started, we were spat on and vilified and tore down on, the, on message boards around the world and on social media and like Ricky's the greatest. They'll never like Ricky was a co-creator of the American show. You know, we're America has a very different business model than the BBC. You guys have, um, you know, you have government supported uh, broadcast. We don't. So our broadcast is hundred percent capitalism through and through. We have to create a successful show that allows for commercials, ad breaks and can is only profitable if it reaches, you know, dozens and dozens or hundreds of episodes. Um, so the same thing is happening with Utopia where uh, all the message boards are, are crowded with Utopia BBC Utopia fans saying, this will never be as good, it's not as good. Ah! And um, with an astounding, an astounding amount of hatred and vitriol. Um, and it's not from a couple dozen people, it's from thousands of people and it's like, we're not stopping the BBC from making more episodes. They canceled the show. Sorry, guys. Uh, I'm sure the BBC show's great. You can watch them over and over again. Our, the existence of our show does not negate those episodes. We are not then pulling those episodes from the air. Um, anyways, that's just a little aside rant there about um, this kind of strange British kind of um, acidic fandom that is really... Uh, strangely uh, corrosive. Um, so uh, I, I really enjoyed doing our, our version of Utopia. I haven't seen the BBC version. I just didn't want to let that in. I'm sure it's great, but um, yeah. So it's a slightly different role for me. Um, Dr. Michael Stearns is a, has a more dramatic role. He does have some great comedic moments. It's something much closer to me than Dwight is. I mean, I'm much more like a nerdy scientist than I am like a fascistic paper salesman, beet farmer, Amish guy, you know? Um, and uh, it's a really cool arc of the character that I got to take uh, with Dr. Stearns. And uh, Gillian Flynn was wonderful to work with. Excuse me. John Cusack was fabulous in the series and um, people seem to really be enjoying it. Um, not quite sure if anyone's watching it, but the people that are watching it uh, are really digging it. So that's, been uh, super cool. Um, and then this other show you mentioned, uh, We Are the Champions, I'm not sure, that's gonna be on Netflix, I'm not sure when it comes out in the UK. It's a documentary series um, uh, that, that looks at uh, kind of quirky comedic sports and uh, treats them very seriously, uh, a deep dive. And I forget the town in England I should know it, but they, every year they have a cheese rolling contest. So one of our documentaries is on the, the cheese rolling contest in this town in England. This is incredibly steep hill and they take a giant wheel of cheese and uh, you chase the cheese down the hill and the, the cheese will win. And whoever's in second place wins a trophy. People break their legs, they break teeth, they break arms every year, but these crazy Brits are just like, <laughs> just filled with pints rolling down the hill, chasing the cheese. It's a really uh, fun and, and beautiful documentary series. So watch for that later this year. That sounds really good. I, yeah, I'll definitely keep an eye for that. Um, first, I think start watching Utopia. I'm a little bit to blame on that. Uh, <laughs> However, you didn't. You're one of those, are you? I You're have... one of them. Oh, Utopia Brit, so much better. No, I haven't seen the the, the Brit version as well. 
Um, but um, like what happened to the office, I, I, I'd assume that once people do watch it, they can understand that to, although they're based on the same thing, they're still very different from each other and both mm -hmm. equally good. Um, but on that note with like online hate, um, how do you personally handle it? Do, if, if you start seeing that too much hate towards either yourself or someone you know, um, how, well, if you had to say, uh, if you had a message to tell them, what would you tell them uh, as in to whoever's being abused? Yeah, um, this is a big issue, online hate, online bullying. When I first started acting, um, the internet was just getting going in the early 2000s and the whole idea of like message boards and comments on shows and stuff like that. And I was on the show called Six Feet Under that was on HBO uh, before I was on The Office. And and I would look on the message boards like every, after every episode, like what did the people say? You know, because at that point you didn't have social, you didn't have Twitter. So they would go on like IMDB or various places that had message boards and write about what they thought. And, you know, I was searching for comments about me partially because of my own narcissism as an actor and my own insecurity as well and I would people would say terrible things just like oh he's terrible and he sucks and he's so weird looking and um it was really um uh it, it was heartbreaking at first you know it really and early on in the office and people like oh he's terrible and he's nowhere near as good as Gareth and He's the worst. And it really like affected me, but I'm kind of glad I went through that phase because I, I really came out of it recently. Like, I don't know if I can swear on, on here, um, but I just really don't give up ah! um, a, what people think. And most people, so many people are haters uh, of me online. You know, I posted something the other day uh, about Halloween. There was a, an event where there was a couple in St. Louis uh, and there were Black Lives Matters protesters walking down the street towards the mayor's house. And they came out and they were pointing their guns at the protesters. And he had a, he had a like AK-47 assault rifle and he was with an extended magazine clip and like pointing it at like grandmothers and children as they were walking by down to the mayor's or governor's house. And, uh, and how th there was an African-American couple uh, that um, did whiteface and dressed up as them for Halloween. And I said, this couple won Halloween because it was hysterical. It's really, really funny when you see their costumes. And I think there's 4,000 comments on my Instagram page from that post. Um, probably 3,700 of them are hate-filled diatribes against me, against Black Lives Matter, uh, promoting people, people should be allowed to defend their homes. And uh, why is it okay for black people to do white face, but white people can't do black face? Isn't that hypocritical? Um, so, you know, I, I don't take this stuff personally. I think there's people are really um, ignorant and misguided. So I did a little video today and just kind of explained like, hey guys, Here's why it's okay for black people to do white face, but not okay for white people to do black face. And how defending your home is very different than pointing a submachine gun at children. Those are very different things. People don't, don't get it. Again, this is partisanship, you know, where they're kind of in lockstep with their political party's talking points to such a degree that they're not able to think for themselves. Um, Also with the partisanship of it, um, and a little bit on social media as well. Um, I do find quite often um, that people usually, the, the more they engage with either side, the more recluded they feel, uh, the more they only start to hear about whatever side they're aligning with, as it kind of turns into an echo chamber. Um, do you feel like, uh, although uh, social media has been... Uh, a blessing for putting people together it's also been the curse at the same point of splitting pe people's opinions uh, what are your takes on politically uh, motivated posts on social media 
I, I think that's fine. Politically motivated posts on social media are fine. People have a right to express what they believe. Sometimes people are very partisan, really love a political candidate. I don't get involved in partisan politics. Um, I don't, I've never spoken up pro candidate or anything like that. I, um, I think it's fine. I think the, the, the question is really about policy and then really about issues. Like what are the issues that are the most strong to you? And that's, this is the problem in the United States is that it's become party over issues. You know, so a lot of people, especially younger people who align themselves with like the Republican Party, also have legitimate concerns about climate change. But because their party has shouted that down and overridden it and said, oh, these people don't know what they're talking about. They're being extremists. And Greta Thunberg is an idiot. And, you know, they're not able to speak. They're not able to have a voice. And people on the political left, it's the same way. There are things about the political left that a lot of people may not agree with. So this, so partisanship has kind of like stultified the intellectual and societal growth of the United States um, with how it works. So I just think that people should focus more on policy than party. Uh, I've just, we've just received a message from the chat obviously because we've just changed the format today. Uh, the chat's been a bit quiet today. Um, sorry about that. So we're probably not going to have that many questions from the audience. Um, but we did have someone asking if you... If Do we have an audience? I see that there's three participants here so, in the... Uh... Uh, oh, so the Zoom chat is uh, separate from the from the stream. So we're being shown, okay. in, shown in the stream. Um, but we had someone Thanks. asking if there was a show that you wish you had to start, which one would it be? If there's a show I, I, I wish I could star in? Yeah. Um, that, that's cool. Yeah, I don't know. Um, um, I'd love to do some like, uh, I'd love to do a show with like a, that's like an action, an action show where I was like a spy or something with like fight scenes. But like it's like a paunchy middle-aged dad, um, <laughs> who gets who gets caught up in a, in a in a spy ring or something, and I have to <laughs> something like that. I think I'd be pretty badass. That that would definitely look really cool. And if it does happen, you've heard it here first. So all right, there we have it. Yeah, exactly. Um, for any any scouts looking around the video. Take note. <laughs> Excellent. Let's see. Second. So you're you're waiting for for questions to come in on the chat, but we don't have any questions coming in on the chat. Unfortunately, not. Um, All right. Do what do you to... want to talk about? Why did you choose blue for your hair, Leo? I'm going to interview you for a while. That, that that's a good change of of, of pace. Um, oh, I personally didn't choose blue. I had blue before. Um. But someone really special to me chose blue, so I went for blue. And now I've kind of just taken in as part of my persona. <laughs> okay, excellent. So, but um, if this is a special person you're dating and the special person then dumps you, are you going to change your hair color? And what, what color would you change it to? Uh, I don't think I'd change my hair color just for the sake of being dumped because although it was their choice, uh, I've also wanted to change my hair color by the time. Uh, plus, I do know if that ever happened, it would be something we, we wouldn't break up in, in that term, so we'd be, we'd be fine. Uh, so I'd probably keep the blue. Plus, it looks sleek. People always come Okay. <laughs> it looks fantastic. Yeah. Uh, anything else you'd like to ask me? When I was, I dyed my hair jet black when I moved to New York City, and I was about 20 years old. And I, I just got a box of like Clairol midnight black hair dye and my girlfriend dyed it in the sink. And, um, but there was one thing I hadn't really considered. Um, uh, I, I didn't dye my eyebrows, which were kind of ginger back then, more like ginger eyebrows. So I had jet black and ginger and I looked like a psycho killer who would be <laughs> writing my my manifesto on the walls of a cabin and his own feces. So um, people just stayed away from me. So maybe I'll go back to that diet black and wear the mask and then people will give me a wide berth. 
Yeah, it's good for a change. Um, we did have another question though coming on the chat. Oh, oh, two now actually. Oh, oh my gosh! Look at these Cambridge kids. It's they're fun. I, I hope they're not asking me those questions. <laughs> at Oxford, I mean, I can't tell you at Oxford how many questions. I mean, it was like three hundred questions. We had so many questions, uh, we didn't even know what to do. The chat went on four hours at Oxford. Oh, all the questions. Um, but yeah. Oh, 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 now we're getting blasted with, see, you mentioned Oxford, now people are- oh, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, first, this is a silly question, but it's quite funny. Uh, I've heard that Dwight broke his back airing uh, season eight and season nine of The Office. Do you think, do you know if he's okay? Uh, I think he's, thank you so much for saying that. I've seen that internet meme. Um, is, I think he's fine. Yeah, he's he's doing okay. Uh, he's he's greatly recovered. Thank you. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, uh, oh, that's actually a good question. Uh, do you think the office could be made in the current political climate, as it's changed so much from the time of the original filming? Uh, I'd assume it's probably to do with uh, political correctness and everything related. Um, but yes. Yeah, it would be tricky. That would be very hard to make the office in the current political climate. Um, if you have racist, sexist boors um, at the center of the show, like Michael and Dwight, um, that um, that would be it. Would be difficult, you know. Um, it would probably be a kind of a situation where if Dwight said. Like Dwight had that joke once. He's like, the w, the, uh, the WNBA people in the women in the WNBA can't play basketball or something, and he degrades them. Like, then someone probably uh, it would stipulate be stipulated by the network that someone would need to say something positive about the WNBA or about women athletes or something like that. A reasonable person would need to say, Dwight, that's not true. Look at all the great women athletes, like the blah, 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 or something. That, like everything would need to have this kind of balance uh, in it. So it's, that really might be, uh, that might be an issue. Um, I think we'll get to a point in time, I don't know when, 10, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, when we can kind of make jokes again. Um, uh, no, not belittling jokes that, you know, belittle and mock you know, the disabled or people of color in racist tropes and stereotypes. I'm not talking about that, but where we can have some fun uh, with some stereotypes that kind of pushes the envelope a little bit. And, uh, but we're not there right now. It's, these wounds are too raw. And um, so maybe it's for the best. I think it's really hard to tell as well, especially these days, because uh, you have such a, an, two extremes that it's really hard to tell if someone's actually being playful if they actually got hatred in their heart. Um, but yeah, that's a really good point. Um, another question from the chat is, uh, as a public figure, uh, how do you handle the hate you get on talking on platforms like Instagram? I'm pretty sure I've asked you that. Um, yep, yep. Uh, kind of been, I've kind of gone into that, yep. I think someone hasn't been looking at the, at the video properly. Um, uh, why do you think extra? Uh, uh, sorry, let me reread this because this isn't right. Uh, what were extraordinary things you've collected uh, when you were working in a series like The Office, uh, like memorabilia or memories or something like that? Um, yeah, I have I have some things like that around. I think somewhere I have Dwight's glasses over here somewhere, I can't find them. Um, I really like to collect um, when people send fan art, not all fan art, but like, um, someone gave me this, for instance. I love how surreal it is. It's a, it's a bear dreaming of Dwight but it's, it's Dwight's head floating in a green sea in the bear's stomach. I'm not exactly sure what it means, but I thought it was fantastic. So I have a bunch of stuff like that. Um, oh, look, here's something. 
Oh yeah, here they are. So I have, because I was showing these to someone else, I have Dwight's glasses and Dwight's cheap ass desk moniker. So a few things like that, but I didn't get to keep a whole lot from the office. They they really locked it down when they when the show was ending. They like told the props guy and the set dressing guy like you're going to be fired. You'll never work at NBC again if you um, if you let any of the cast take any of their stuff. So it was uh, it was tough. I hope that's not going to cost anyone's job now. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> um, the <clears throat> Uh, someone asked regarding the last question uh, about political correctness. Uh, do you think the change was for good? Uh, do you think there's anything that could have been done better? Um, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have many, much opinion about political correctness. I mean, I think it's really nice and fun to kind of tell jokes in in some ways one could say like michael scott saying um um something like he said something about retarded people which is a word you're not it's not politically correct to use and i'm just using it in the context of referencing it on the show and he says like um uh he's so and so is retarded not in the developmental sense because you're not supposed to say that but that's a word that you can use when you're joking around with friends he says something like that only a much funnier version of that and uh a uh, retard or something like that and uh this is and it's funny because so many americans think that way and But Michael Scott being a buffoon and saying out loud what so many people think, like, what's the greater good, let's say, if if an association of people with uh, developmental disabilities or physical disabilities, wheelchair users or whatever, uh, or it doesn't have anything to do with wheelchair users, but if, if there was some, I'm trying to think of some organization that came down and said, hey, that's not right to make jokes about that. Isn't it better actually to show a buffoon making jokes about that to on another level highlight um, how inappropriate it is and yet it's something that so many people think? So uh, there's a really good debate. The problem is we're not having the discussion. We're not having the debate about uh, political correctness. Um, It's either like people are just pro-political correctness you know, everything, everyone else be damned. If anyone's feelings are hurt, fuck them. And then there's people that are, you know, uh, pro-political correctness that don't even want to talk about like, where's that line? Um, Because it's like anything that's not PC is is derogatory and hurtful and bullying. So we're just not having that civil discussion. Um, Like so many other discussions we're not having right now. Yeah, I think this is why comedy is really important to play this role right now. Like, for example, uh, Borat that just came out, uh, it's a prime example of that. Uh, you need to exacerbate how bad things are so people understand, oh, wait, this is not correct. We shouldn't be doing that. If you if you don't have someone to do you that, uh, people yeah. don't. Um, yeah. It was your- brilliant. The new Borat was brilliant. It was really exciting to see. It was, um, it was exhilarating. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm still yet to see it. I haven't, I haven't catched up with anything recently. Um, but another question, uh, like I said, the chat is raving right now. Um, do you think acting uh, enables you to reach and connect to wider audiences through uh, Soap Pancake? Yes, absolutely. One of the reasons I was really able to successfully launch Soul Pancake was because of my celebrity. Um, I was one of the first celebrities on Twitter, um, and we built a large audience from my Twitter following. Um, we were there kind of with early YouTube channels. Our YouTube channel was in like 2012 or something like that, and we were able, able to build that. And I did a lot of interviews. We wrote a book. Um, I wonder if I have it here. So Pancake, Chew on Life's Big Questions. Um, I really need to keep my books around to show show off. I have other people's books, but not mine. So we wrote a book that was a bestseller. Um, 
but all of this wouldn't have been possible if I wasn't an actor. So I was very lucky to, to be able to kind of help launch a company with my name and my gorgeous face. <laughs> no, that's always good to hear. Um, let, let me see, I think we have time for some more, another three questions or so. Uh, and there should okay. be an ask as well. Uh, da, 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 da. So, where is it? So this is one another question I'm bringing back from the office. Uh, I was trying to avoid the office questions because I did say I was going to avoid bringing back the office. But uh, what is your favorite gym prank in the office? I come to Cambridge University, the <laughs> second most next to Oxford prestigious university in the world. I come to Cambridge University and someone from Cambridge says, what's your favorite gym prank? Is, is the next question going to be, what was it like to work with Steve Carell? Is that going to be the question? I kind of asked that before already. You kind of did that, but you did it in a more intelligent way. So um, shame on you, Cambridge. <laughs> shame on you. Um, I like the gym prank where um, he put the small uh, explosive device in Dwight's sandwich and then he bites down on it and um, it explodes off his jaw. So jaw, Dwight's jaw flies across the room to accounting and hits Kevin in the side of the face. And then just the top of Dwight's skull is there and just fluids are pulling out, pouring out like saliva, spinal fluid, bile, vomit. Um, that was, that one was, that really, that still gets, it still cracks me up uh and back at so a, a little bit of a still related to the office but also not too much and uh, not to the content itself um do you think how do you think it was working back for nbc back then uh did much get censored at the office um not very much got censored at the office i mean i wasn't privy to the you know, early draft that might have been sent to the network where they edited some jokes and stuff like that. So um, the only thing that I know that got centered was we did a Halloween episode, kind of season six. And in it, uh, Michael, we were in the warehouse. It's the one where Jim had was book face and he had the, he had the, the three hole punch. Was it three hole punch, Jim? No, it book face. I think that was the one. Uh, he wrote Facebook on his face. And um Michael hung himself. We came around the corner and like fake hung himself. And he's like, ah, and um, he's, he's like, I'm a suicide victim or something like that. And then the suicide hotline people called and were like, you really can't do that. You can't make fun of suicide. And it gives people the idea to make, to commit suicide. And, you know, for families of people who have lost people to suicide, it's not funny. And, I think they had a good point. You know, it's kind of too bad, but you know, they have a good point. This is, this is where this conversation gets really tricky. Uh, and then another question as well. Now, if there was nothing that could hold you back, uh, is there any particular story that you like to tell, uh, especially through the medium of like film or television? Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's many. Thanks, th thanks. That's a very smart question. Um, uh, there are many stories that I would like to tell. Um, one of the ones I'm working on right now is the story of a woman named Tahare, and she was a Persian poet from the mid 19th century, and um, she was a poet, a philosopher, a mystic, and essentially the first kind of hero of the women's rights movement. And people don't know about her and don't know her name. Um, I'm a member of the Baha'i faith. She was also an early member of the Baha'i faith and she took off her veil as a form of social protest and um, was subsequently later on killed, thrown into a well and stoned to death. Um, essentially because of that, uh, of that act. Um, and people don't really know about, you know, these early pioneers of the women's movement, you know, at the, at the forefront of the, you know, women's suffrage movement, let's say. Um, and this, this Tahare activity was happening at um, the same time as the, 
first origins of the women's suffrage movement in the mid 1800s. So, but there's many, many more than that. Um, <clears throat> and da, 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 da. Let me a second. I lost the question here. Um, why do you think that ordinary things like pretty much everything at about the office turned out to be so extraordinary when they were put into television? Uh, was it just the acting? Was it the way it was scripted? Was it just a, a general consensus or something like that? Uh, yeah, so that's that's a great question. So uh, television is a very collaborative art. So if you are missing one of the legs of the stool, it won't be good. I mean, there are shows that have great acting and great directing, but the writing's weak and it's not very good. So, you know, you need great writing, you need great acting um, going hand in hand. You need solid enough directing um, to make it happen. You need the right outlet for it, the right um, platform for it to come out on. Um, so you, it's really hard to say. I mean, we had the smartest, best writers. I, I think that, and, and the smartest, best actors too, um, as evidenced by their careers. But I think Greg Daniels, the showrunner of the American office, he's really exquisite, exquisite, smart taste um, and really guided the ship expertly toward that fine line of being kind of mass uh, mass television appreciated by you know tens of millions of people and at the same time always always smart and some jokes being kind of like too too cool for school too smart for school um and pushing the envelope a little bit so uh he did that expertly and and really uh we were grateful to be under his guidance and leadership well, listen, Leo, I should, um, I should get going. Thank you so much for having me in the Cambridge Union office chat. And uh, 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 this was really a lot of fun, you and your blue hair. And, and uh, much love to everyone out there. Do you have like a mascot? It's like the Cambridge Bulldogs or the Dragons or something? Oh, not quite. Uh, at least not that I would know of. I'm not a Cambridge student. Mm. Uh, I'm from the smaller side university in here um, oh okay anything all right yeah it's kind of the mascot of the union uh okay excellent uh the cambridge blue hairs then yes uh well it was great to have you in uh, i'm glad you have fun hopefully in the future when everything's listed we can rectify the, the not so great questions by having you in the chamber uh oh stop <laughs> yeah but it'll it's be all right to have you back this was a lot of fun and it was a great discussion and people need to be having more deep, meaningful, probing discussions about lots of uh, bigger issues and about the office, the UK, <laughs> and about utopia, US versus UK. So um, it was really a, a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, thank you. Okay. Have a good night. So long. <laughs>